Okay, champions, it's time to do a little review for papers one, two, and three. So I've put together this who's who version of IB 20th century world history that is sort of morphed into the entire course in one PowerPoint. It's the packet I printed out before break and handed to you, but just to go over it together, this is going to include not just paper two and paper three topic information, but paper one topic information as well. I thought I'd start out chronological order like we began the year with Russia to the Soviet Union. In terms of your key people, you could know as many as you want, but I would say you definitely want to have information on Lenin and Stalin. You're probably not going to write about Lenin for paper two, topic 10 authoritarian states. You're probably going to write about Stalin, but in writing about Stalin's rise to power, if you choose to write about his rise to power, if you have that kind of question, you need to know information about Lenin. And the split between Lenin and Trotsky, as well as the schism between Stalin and Trotsky, would be helpful to know as well. So I might include some of that Trotsky information. Embedded throughout this PowerPoint are a number of notes, timelines, activities that we've done in class. This is based on the reading Stalin, Bad But Brilliant. So it's chronologically the development of the Soviet Union following the revolutions and the Civil War, and then the role of Stalin and how he has been assessed as we have moved into the present day um, through revisionism and post-revisionism. In terms of your key leaders post-Stalin, in terms of paper two, topic 12, Cold War, I see you writing about Nikita Khrushchev the most. There is some possibility to bring in Brezhnev with the Brezhnev doctrine. Um, and in terms of Mikhail Gorbachev, I think that would only be a collapse of the Soviet Union independence movements in the Eastern Europe question. Remember, Khrushchev can be used for... Berlin crisis, he could be used for Cuban Missile Crisis. There's a number of places that you can use him, but more often than not, it's going to be in Paper 2, Topic 12, Cold War. They do sometimes ask questions, especially the second question in Paper 2, Topic 10, Authoritarian States, that focus on women and children or ethnic minorities or how different groups were treated or persecuted in single party authoritarian states. So this is just something to keep in mind. We did spend some time with the USSR talking about the roles of women and children, and that can be before and after World War II. Don't feel like you have to memorize a number of the Russian names. You don't have to remember Komsomol Youth Movement, but if you can remember a young Octoberist or a young pioneers, that would certainly be helpful. If you did the activity in class about everyday Stalinism and focused on Birobzbidan and the Jews that were moved from primarily Moscow area and the Crimean Peninsula area to the border of China, then that might be something you would focus on with a persecution of minority groups. If you have information on different ethnic republics, those would be helpful as well. For historiography, remember historiography is the cherry on top of our Sunday for papers one, two, and three. In terms of the Soviet Union, you can always go with the Soviet Orthodox view. That's going to be the one that's supported by the party. That's going to be the one that represents the demands of the state. That's going to be reflected in their publications like Pravda. It's always going to be countered by the Western liberal view. Remember, Richard Pipes is our OG Western liberal who said that the only positive reason for rising abortion rates in the Soviet Union was more dead Soviets. Like, that's hardcore stuff. You do have some outliers here, like Dmitry Volkogonov, who was formerly part of the Soviet military machine. And upon going into the archives and realizing what had happened in the history of the Soviet Union, he changed his mind and is sort of on the side of the Western liberals. You can always bring in a Marxist perspective because the Marxists are going to disagree with the Western liberals as well as disagree with how the supposed communist regimes are implementing communism. Isaac Deutscher is the guy who wrote the multi-part biography on Trotsky. So he's a name you can bring in. 
I'd say other than that, you really want to focus on your revisionists, especially social historians like Sheila Fitzpatrick. We did read a lot of Robert Service and we brought in some material from Orlando Figs and Walter Lefebvre, but Fitzpatrick is the one that we really used when we were looking at everyday Stalinism. And she focused on the lives of the ordinary people and how they were impacted by what was happening in, say, the Stalinist regime. I have some profiles of these historians here. Here's a little profile of Sheila. Remember, she was actually in the Soviet Union researching when she was accused of spying and was kicked out of the country. Jumping to China, which is what we studied next, a little background on Chairman Mao Zedong. Remember that the Chinese Communist Party existed first, and then it was the army, and then it was the state. And he is going to take on the role of chairman when he rises to power in 1949. Remember that cool quote that we used to do a lot of our pre-writing? Had Mao died in 1956, his achievements would have been immortal. Had he died in 66, he still would have been great man, but flawed. But he died in 76. Alas, what can one say? And that really represents Mao's two separate rises to power. The Mao that led the Long March, the Mao that was part of the United Front and ultimately established the PRC. But it's also the Mao that was responsible for the great leap into famine and had to step down from power and comes back with the great proletarian cultural revolution. Um, and that happens from 1966 until his death. In terms of other people to know, Peng Dehuai is the one person that stands up at the Lushan conference and reads that poem about the vines withering on the ground and is the only time that Mao is openly criticized for the famine. Lin Biao is his designated successor. He's the one that's going to be responsible for the publication of the Little Red Book, but may or may not have been involved in a coup attempt to overthrow him, and that's going to lead to his plane crashing in Mongolia. Uh, Madame Mao and the Gang of Four are going to seek power after Mao's death, and then that's going to lead to the ascension of Hua Gaofang, who had the two whatevers policy, and then Deng Xiaoping, who's going to revolutionize China. Black cat, white cat, I don't care as long as it catches mice for modernizations. If you bring in a little Liu Xiaoqi or Zhou Enlai, that would be super helpful, especially because Zhou Enlai was potentially going to be Mao's successor, but ended up dying before him in 76 and led to the protests during the King Ming Festival or tomb sweeping. We have a Mao timeline that we did in class where we sort of went over the history of China and then the establishment of the PRC. Remember that we did all those domestic policies in class in that group assignment where we all shared a document and then take you through all the way to 76 with the death of Mao. So this is going to be first rise to power. And then after the famine, we're going to have second rise to power with the great proletarian cultural revolution. You do not have to refer to it as such in your writing. You can just call it the, pro the cultural revolution. That would be a lot easier. Just like with the Soviet Union, I gave you a little information about women and children. So the banning of arranged marriages, the allowing for divorce, that's also going to be really helpful in writing about women. And then with his second rise to power in the Cultural Revolution, you have the role of these Red Guard in destroying the four olds, and they ultimately become so difficult to handle that they are sent up to the mountains and down to the villages, sometimes translated to countryside. This is the sent down youth movement. Also couldn't resist a chance to put in a picture of Mao during the Great Swim. Love dictator in a robe. In terms of minority groups in the PRC, we want to remember that the vast majority of people living in mainland China are not ethnically Han Chinese. And what happens to those other groups, especially, say, in the Tibetan region or the Uyghur region, even in the Inner Mongolia region, is something that you can bring in as additional information for a paper two. I mean, historiography here, we know we're going to be using Chang and Halliday, the unflinching critics of Mao, but you probably also want to bring in somebody else, either like an Edgar Snow, Red Star Over China, which was pro-Mao before the establishment of the PRC, or you want to bring in something about the famine literature, or you want to bring in something about the Cultural Revolution. Remember, we read that article on Jonathan Spence, so that would be helpful. 
There are a number of historians who specialize in the great proletarian cultural revolution. I think this is really interesting down here about scar literature, the literature of the wounded that emerges after the death of Mao, about the suffering of the cadres and the tragic experience of the cultural revolution. That could be something really interesting to bring in. Jumping ahead to paper two, topic 12, Cold War, superpower tensions and rivalries. Hoa, kids, this overlaps with your paper three, section 16, Cold War and the Americas, 45 to 81. I have a whole bunch of notes from a million years ago that you might find helpful here to go back and look at. Remember that we spent a lot of time in the eh, late fall, early winter, looking at key figures in the early Cold War. We read that Walter Lippmann piece where he coined the phrase Cold War before World War II was even over. We read excerpts of George Kennan's long telegram, AKA Article X, in which he postulated that the palsy decrepitude of the capitalist world is the keystone of communist philosophy, AKA we have to keep the US going in order to prevent the communists from taking over. You work with not only Churchill's Iron Curtain speech, but Stalin's response to the Iron Curtain speech as published in Pravda. Remember, Churchill was not prime minister at the time when he makes that speech, and he's also making it in Fulton, Missouri. For my paper three kids, you want to know FDR for paper three as well as paper two. You want Great Depression information, New Deal information for domestic policies, and you want World War II Grand Alliance information for foreign policies. If you wanted to go deep here, you could look at, say, the role of Avril Harriman. Um, in terms of other presidents that you might want to do a little refreshing on, Truman's role in the Cold War, Truman Doctrine, Marshall Plan, Berlin Airlift, Korean War, those would also be really helpful. Uh, but likewise, you could use Eisenhower as an additional president to study. George Marshall and the Marshall Plan would be someone that you would want to think about and bring in. Remember, we did that activity with images from the Marshall Plan. And I highly recommend knowing Eisenhower because you can look at his foreign policy as participating in World War II, promising to get us out of Korea, and then ultimately implementing the Eisenhower Doctrine in the Middle East after the Suez Crisis and then compare slash contrast that with his domestic policies and role in terms of civil rights movement. For historians, our key historian for Cold War is going to be John Lewis Gaddis. He's known as the Dean of Cold War Historiography. This is an activity we did in class where we looked at the historiography of the Cold War from the Western liberal perspective, Soviet Orthodox perspective, revisionist perspectives, and post-revisionist post-Cold War perspectives. Remember one of the author's names was Craphole and you guys laughed about it. This would be a helpful slide slash document to go back and review. We did the activity with Cold War theories. I do believe that the first slide was a James Bond from Russia with Love slide. You don't have to memorize all of the Cold War theories, but it would be helpful to flesh out a discussion of Western liberal historiography with the Russian menace theory or of Soviet Orthodox historiography with the US imperialist theory. Your Marxists are always coming in hot with the class conflict theory. You could bring in superpower theory that would be helpful to drop and also arms race. Some other key terms would be things like mutually assured destruction or mad. In terms of paper two, topic 10, single party states, we did not study Nasser enough for me to feel comfortable having you guys compare and contrast him with another authoritarian state leader. But we did spend some time discussing the Suez crisis and the repercussions of the Suez crisis, especially with Khrushchev in Hungary and with Eisenhower and the Eisenhower doctrine. It could be an interesting topic if you get a paper two topic 12 Cold War question asking you about Cold War crises. And I just have additional information on there to flesh it out for you. Remember that Nasser is part of the non-aligned movement. He's one of the founders. This was based on the Bandung Conference and the idea that two thirds of the population of the earth was neither aligned with the US and capitalist democracy or the Soviet Union and alleged communism. Though Castro is not a founding member of this organization, he is going to be at 
um, a number of conferences. Um, one of the, the first leader in the Americas to join this, and he's going to head the conferences several times. A little Nasser historiography. Remember when we watched that documentary that Anthony Nutting was both participating in and then commenting on the events that were happening? So that would certainly be interesting to discuss. No discussion of Nasser would be complete without a discussion of Nasserism, which is a combination of Arab nationalism, Pan-Arabism, and Arab socialism. I have additional historiography information here if you are interested. Jumping ahead to Cuba, Cuba is an important one. This is paper two, top 10 authoritarian states with Castro. This is paper two, topic 12, Cold War, super tower tensions and rivalries in terms of Bay of Pigs invasion and Cuban missile crisis. And it's also paper three history of the Americas. Castro questions sometimes pop up in section 14, political developments in the Americas after the second world war. And you could definitely bring in Castro information for Cold War in the Americas 45 to 81. Key figures here that you'd want to hone in on, obviously Fidel Castro, his successor and brother Raul, and as well the role of Che Guevara. This timeline from class included Cuban history and then Cold War history that I tried to color code for you and then kept going until the death of Fidel. I know that this is a long time period to focus on, but we really want to focus in on that idea of will history absolve Fidel Castro? Hmm. In paper two, topic 10, authoritarian states, we want to be prepared for that question that may deal with women. There are a number of key women in the Cuban revolution that later go on to serve in the government. Jaide Santa Maria and Melba Hernandez are there in the Moncada barracks attacks that failed July 26 attack for which the July 26 movement gets its name. You also might want to bring in a Celia Sanchez or a Vilma Espin, especially because of the Federation of Cuban Women. So those would also be really helpful people to know. In terms of minority issues in Cuba, this is the lesson we did that was sort of choose your own adventure, where you could look into what happened to the Marielitos and the Mariel Boatlift of 1980, the evolution of LGBTQIA rights in Cuba over time, the situation of Afro-Cubanos, the role of women or censorship. All of those would be interesting to go back and look at. You might want to review your notes. In terms of historiography for Cuba, remember that Sebastian Balfour quote about his demonization or canonization has left little space for balanced accounts of his life and work, at least outside of academia and serious journalism. So you're going to have either aggressively anti-Castro sources or aggressively pro-Castro sources, and there's very little in between. Um, we looked at a number of those in class, so pick and choose as you see fit. Also remember that we categorized Castro. If you are asked an ideology question, and always be careful with ideology questions, there are arguments to be made for Castro being a nationalist, a populist, an authoritarian, a caudillo, a left winger, a Marxist of convenience, and any of those can be used to build a significant argument. For my HOA friends, here are your Cold War presidents, actually before and after the Cold War, Cold War presidents. HOA paper three, Great Depression, that'd be an FDR question primarily with recovery and um, New Deal. Second World War in the Americas, definitely an FDR question. There could be some Herbert Hoover information with the Great Depression question, but it really depends on what you get. Obviously, these are Cold War presidents, so paper two, topic 10, Cold War, but they also encompass paper three political developments in the Americas after the Second World War, Cold War in the Americas, as well as civil rights, which is why you should probably know three of these presidents' foreign and domestic policies like the back of your hand. And then the last would be Section 18, the Americas 1980 to 2005. And I sort of caution you on that one because we didn't spend a lot of time on it in class. So again, I really think an FDR perhaps an LBJ, 
and an Eisenhower would be strong picks for you to review. I do have your presidential doctrines in great detail here. They have asked a number of Kennedy questions in the past. There was a new frontier question not that long ago. Um, I'd really focus in on Johnson material. And if you're choosing to do Eisenhower, I would make sure you compare and contrast his foreign policy with his domestic policies. Paper two, topic 10, Cold War, often has question 23, which focuses on dates, and 24, which focuses on regions. And sometimes those regions can be addressed in terms of crises. So I've given you background information on the two Berlin crises that we studied, 48, 49, that's blockade and airlift, and then 60, 61, that ultimately culminates with the building of the wall. This is literally a slide from one of your assignments. So you have this information to peruse at your leisure. Korean War is one of the case studies that we did. Definitely something that you could bring in on contrasting areas or regions, especially if you're asked for um, two different countries, each from a different region. This would be helpful in going back and remembering. Bruce Cummings is our historian that said we dropped more bombs on South Korea than we did in Europe during World War II. Um, Remember the firing of Douglas MacArthur. Remember the Chang and Halliday reading that we did about how Mao and Stalin started the Korean War. There was a follow-up chapter, Mao and Stalin milking the Korean War. Those would all be helpful to remember. Depending on how comfortable you are or how familiar you are with the Suez crisis, you could definitely bring that in, especially if you were using two different regions. Obviously, the Americas, a separate region from the rest. Bay of Pigs invasion, Cuban Missile Crisis, and the ongoing embargo would all be hot topics that definitely overlap from Paper 2 to Paper 3. So something that you could use perhaps in a Paper 1, Topic 10, a Paper 2, Topic 12, and even a Paper 2, oh, sorry, a Paper 3. Vietnam War was, again, a case study. We did this just before... Ooh, uh, I think it might have been the last thing we did in 2022. Um, don't know how familiar you are, but remember the role of Arthur Schlesinger Jr. as a historian. You also might want to bring in the points of view of Mac Bundy and Dean Rusk, especially from a Western liberal perspective. Our role in Vietnam, and for those of you who are going in and studying LBJ, Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, Operation Rolling Thunder, those would all be helpful. In terms of American historiography, can't go wrong with the Western liberal point of view. However, you'd want to perhaps bring in some revisionism or some post-revisionism. If we're talking about the Cold War, you can't go wrong with a John Lewis Gaddis. Uh, in terms of our civil rights materials, that's when you'd want to bring in a social historian, say, for example, like Zinn. Just a quick recap on paper one, prescribed topic four, rights and protest. It's a 50-50 shot, whether you have case study one, civil rights movements in the United States, 54 to 65, or case study two, apartheid South Africa, 48 to 64. It is a coin toss, my friends. You're going to find out on test day when you open up your packets. It would be worth going back to some of our materials on South Africa, the documents that you read about Congress of the Peoples and the Freedom Charter, the work that we did with Sharpville, perhaps even um, looking back at the Bantustan paper one, and then definitely the materials on the Ravonia trial. Though I only have to take you to 64, it is helpful to have outside information about not just Mandela, but also former President F.W. de Klerk and the Archbishop Desmond Tutu and their role in the Truth and Reconciliation Commissions. That would be really interesting. You should know Chief Albert Letuli, but perhaps you also want to go back and look at maybe an Oliver Tambo or a Walter Sisulu, maybe bring in some information about the Federation of South African Women or some of your communists, say your Rusty Bernsteins, your Joe Slobos, or your Martin Legacix. Here are your architects of apartheid. The reason that this 
topic starts in 1948 is because that's when the National Party is going to win the election and they are going to use the term apartheid or apartness and they're going to begin to build that policy, that BASCAP. Remember that 1950s is petty apartheid and 1960s is grand apartheid and segregation becomes a policy of the state. This goes into that bullet point of nature and characteristics of discrimination. We have a number of organizations that are in opposition to apartheid. Obviously, you need to know the ANC, um, ANC Defiance Campaign, ANC Youth League, and then ultimately Unconto Wisiswe or Spear of the Nation would be outgrowths of the ANC. ANC members are going to participate in the Congress of the Peoples and the authoring of the Freedom Charter. Robert Sabukwe's Pan-Africanist Congress, or PAC, is going to be a breakaway from the ANC and going to advocate Black nationalism, socialism, and continental unity, as opposed to the ANC's larger multiracial, multiethnic uh, philosophy for a new South Africa. Here are some of your key figures that you may want to look into. Other organizations in opposition to apartheid, you do not want to underestimate the Federation of South African Women. They are going to help organize the Congress of the Peoples. South African Indian Congress has a strong history in South Africa and includes the participation of Mahatma Gandhi in early past protests. And don't forget your South African communists, especially Lionel Rusty Bernstein, Joe Slovo, and Ruth First, who is going to be killed for her participation in this movement. And then Martin Legasik, he's one of those radical revisionists we studied when we learned about historiography. In terms of our key figures, you can just look at the Ravonia trial and see a number of them. Obviously, Nelson Mandela, Walter Sisulu, Oliver Tambo. Oh, look, here's Rusty Bernstein. We've got a number of key figures. Here they are again, and they're different allegiances. In terms of South African historiography, I would say you're really con comparing and contrasting Afrikaner nationalist views with African nationalist views. Afrikaner nationalist views would be those supported by the National Party and pro-apartheid, whereas your African nationalist views are sort of split in two with the views supported by the ANC versus the PAC. And you can always bring in your radical revisionism and your Marxist arguments. Jumping to case study two, American Civil Rights Movement. You want to be familiar with all of the nature and characteristics of discrimination material that we've gone over in class as a review. We want to look at specific protests and action, Montgomery bus boycott, Freedom Rides, Freedom Summer, Civil Rights Act, Voting Rights Act. HOA people, this is section 17, Civil Rights and Social Movements after 1945. Some of those questions are going to extend into the 1980s, and it's going to move beyond African American Civil Rights Movement and include Red Power Movement, Hippies and Yippies, Feminist Movement, um, a number of different aspects that we don't cover in the Paper 1 case study. So just a reminder, you also want your president's information on this. You want to roll, know your key organizations and the roles of leaders and groups, especially NAACP, SCLC, SNCC. I would add core to this list, Nation of Islam, though they only have key figures here listed as Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, and LBJ. We have talked about a number of figures that we would want to add as well. This is just in chronological order to help you out. Here are your big six. Always amazed that John Lewis was 23 when he spoke at the March on Washington. And never forget the role of Bayard Rustin in a number of these civil rights movements that he did not play a role in the forefront in because his history being associated with communism and socialism, being a homosexual, being an, inter an interracial relationship, this would have torn him up in the media and then detracted from the movement. Here are a number of your key figures that we just recently talked about. Remember, Linda Brown is a real person in this Brown v. Board of Education case. 
Information about Thurgood Marshall would always be helpful here. Information about the legal wing of the NAACP, their role in representing Rosa Parks. Remember that there were other women who were refusing to give up their seats on buses before Rosa Parks, like Irene Morgan and Claudette Colvin. In terms of desegregation, we have our little Rock Nine figures and little Ruby Bridges. And we also want to focus that those that did not make it through to see adulthood, such as Emmett Till. Here we have a number of key figures. Ella Baker, who is going to be the organizer of SNCC, in addition to all of these other accolades. Stokely Carmichael, who's going to be a leading member of SNCC and then spin off to found the Black Panther Party. We have Fannie Lou Hamer here, who is just sick and tired of being sick and tired. She's going to play a significant role in Mississippi's Freedom Summer. We have Floyd McKissick here, who is the leader of CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality. We also have Diane Nash, who's a leading figure in SNCC. Don't forget your Freedom Riders. Don't forget your sit-in figures, your Greensboro Four. James Meredith um, and Medgar Evers were both looking for desegregation of education in Mississippi. Medgar Evers is going to be killed for this. James Meredith is going to be shot and then recovered. Here are our Mississippi Freedom Summer victims. Here are 16th Street Baptist Church bombing victims and all of those that were injured on Edmonton Pettus Bridge on Bloody Sunday in the Selma March. Here is John Lewis during the event and then 50 years after. In terms of black nationalism and movements as they changed through the 60s and then later into the 70s, we definitely have Malcolm X, who is part of Nation of Islam and then converts to Sunni Islam after his Hajj to Mecca. You could bring in Alex Haley as the author of his biography. Elijah Muhammad, the leader of Nation of Islam when Malcolm X converts is very much influenced by Garveyism and Back to Africa movement. Malcolm X is going to be supported by other figures. When he is assassinated, he is cradled by Yuri Kochiyama, who was about racial consciousness and the Yellow Power movement. And here we have Betty Shabazz, who has carried on her husband's legacy. Other key figures, Angela Davis, Marxist, feminist, political advocate, Tommy Smith and John Carlos with the Black Power salute in 1968 Mexico City Olympics. And then we have our Black Panther Party members, co-founder Huey P. Newton, Bobby Seale, Elder Big Man Howard. Those would also be helpful figures to know. In terms of civil rights historiography, this has definitely changed over time from a heroic narrative, really focusing on MLK and his I Have a Dream speech, to added complexity to shifting time frames of the movement. Interesting to bring up would be the long civil rights movement thesis about lengthening the era and spreading the movement spatially. Um, that would be something interesting to bring in for historiography on either a paper one or a paper three regarding civil rights. You have a number of, of places of crossover between civil rights participants and civil rights historians. Last bit here, paper two, topic 12, Cold War. Again, Cold War comes up in paper three as well. I'm pretty much taking you from detente to the collapse of the Soviet Union with key figures and events. You could choose to study regionally like solidarity movement in Poland or reunification after the fall of the wall in Germany. You could look at collapse of the USSR. You could look at singing revolutions in the Baltic states, the fate of the Ceausescus in Romania, a post-Tito Yugoslavia, Velvet Revolution in Czechoslovakia, democracy package in Hungary, or what has happened to my beloved Ukraine. Sadly for Belarus, Lukashenko remains in charge. In terms of global developments in the Cold War era, you'd want to look at the role of Reagan and Thatcher and Gorbachev, which was an activity from class, by the way. Uh, we didn't spend as much time in the post-Mao Mao era, but that could be brought in. Um, 
Castro was still around, guys. Like, you can still discuss Castro in later Cold War, especially in terms of Angolan civil war, and then that makes that connection to South Africa. So here's just your transition from Gorbachev to Yeltsin and the collapse of the Soviet Union and the independence movements in these Eastern European countries. Here are your key leaders after Stalin. I would pretty much only focus on Brezhnev. I mean, Khrushchev, obviously, but in the detente era, it would be Brezhnev and Gorbachev is where I'd really put my focus. Just some important reminders about the test. Paper one and paper two are on the same day. It's an hour for paper one. You want to spend that first 40 minutes on questions 13 through 15 and then save yourself 20 minutes to write question 16. Answer the cue opposing view, justify the two. Then you have paper two. You are answering a question in topic 10, authoritarian states. You are answering a question in topic 12, Cold War. You are ignoring all of the other questions. And for my HOA friends, you come in the next day in the morning and you can pick any three of the HOA questions to answer. I have helpful reminders here on paper one timing, on the documents that you need to use. Remember that when you write your question 16, it's sort of like a deconstructed ice cream sundae. You need document information, you need outside information, argumentation and historiography is the cherry on top. First thing you do is read question 16 first because this is the theme of all of our documents. Here are previous questions that have been asked. We've gone over these in class. Here's a generic paper one rubric if you want to sort of pre-calculate what you need. Um, everyone should be aiming for higher than, than 18 marks um, would be a goal that I would set for you. In terms of paper two, these are 15 marks a piece, so 30 marks total. You are answering only one in topic 10 and one in topic 12. You have an hour and 30 minutes, so it's just like two class time essays back to back. It can be emergence of authoritarian states, consolidation of maintenance of power, aims and results of policies for topic 10, rivalry, mistrust and accord, leaders and nations, Cold War crises for topic 12. Know your regions, know your leaders, know your crises. Most of these are going to be compare and contrast. If not compare and contrast, they're probably going to be similar to a change over time essay. We want an introduction and a conclusion. We want three body paragraphs. We want argumentation. In terms of your topic 10 essay prompts, oh, look, they're going to pull from these words. They're going to pick these and construct the questions. So familiarize yourself with the subtopics. Here are previous paper two topic 10 questions. You may want to practice by outlining these. You may want to practice these by making a four part chart. You'll notice some themes and some repetition. You're discussing with reference to two. So compare contrast. Question 23 for Topic 12 Cold War will usually be chronological. They tend to lean towards the beginning of the Cold War time period. There is an exception here in November of 2020, and here we have it again in 2021. Question 24 will be compare contrast usually about regions or crises. For my paper three friends, you want to lean hard into the HOA topics that overlap with papers one and two, and you want to lean into the things that you're most familiar with. You do not have to write these essays in order. If the Cold War and civil rights questions are easiest for you, write those first, and then say you wanted to write a Great Depression question, you can write that third. Just remember you put the numbers in the little boxes. This is what it looks like when you get your questions. You can definitely take notes in the packets if you so choose, but I recommend doing your pre-writing in your answer booklet and then crossing it out before you write your essay. For your IB command terms, you're most likely going to get either analyze, discuss, evaluate, or compare, contrast. Even if they ask you just compare, or even if they ask you just contrast, what they really mean is compare, contrast. Here's some thesis help. You want to make an argument. You want to take a stance. You can challenge the question. 
you want to use higher level vocabulary, use those palabras picantes, stop bringing in those dead possum words. I have mark bands here if you want to look at them or see where you need to fall, but that's up to you. Good luck.